Bienvenidos, señores y señores, to another episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast has been brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, football, college football, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting, and your favorite casino and card games are available to play right from your phone. So head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use the promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Ben Online, where the game starts. And joining us on the Carrera de Asada, making a return visit, the Padrino, ladies and gentlemen, the former general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, the man that gives us all comfort just by hearing his voice, Ned Coletti. Ned, ¿cómo estás, amigo? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I don't know that I brought everybody comfort with my voice, but, you know, I guess at this stage, I guess I might. Yeah. Look, Ned, every time you come on the show, I have at least two listeners that come up to me and say, they send me messages saying, thanks for having Ned on. Ned makes everything right in the world. I guess the way you explain things, you know, because we're in full panic mode right right now because it's the playoffs, <laughs> right, Ned? So that's why we want to have you on the show. We want to hear your takes. But before that, Ned, I want to get your opinion on the regular season. Because going into this season, there was a lot of talk. The show pods were going to run away with the division. They were going to take a step back. I think the last time we were on the show, we had talked about, I think you were the last general manager of the Dodgers that tried to do a combination of younger talent and, and, and veterans. How did you think this regular season went? And are you as surprised as everyone else? Like everyone thinks the Dodgers overachieved. Well, I, I think there's 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 two two points I'd make. Um, as I look back on the season and different shows that I was on early, I thought that this was going to be a year in transition, which it was. But I also thought this was the year that if San Diego was going to make a serious move, this could be the year. If San Francisco, Arizona would make a serious move, this would be the year. As it turned out, they couldn't make a serious move. Arizona has been the best of that lot. Colorado still way behind everybody. Uh, but this was the year, I thought, because I think by the time we get to the beginning of next season, you've got so many players now, as we look back on this year, that have got experience. We can never discount the value of experience. And I think that they've been able to, to mix in a lot of young pitching, some young players. And I think that this was the year for some team to take advantage of, of their transition. Nobody did. And so, but that's the difference between the Dodgers and everybody else. They play it, and they, they don't take it a bat off, a pitch off, and they make people compete. There you go, Alicia. The Padrino said they had their chance and they blew it. So now, you know, the Dodgers are going to run away for it for another 10 years. They may. Yep. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Too bad, so sad for them. It's Dodger fans, we're so spoiled, man. We really are. And my co host isn't lying. There's something about speaking to, Ned Coletti, that does calm us down. That does, you know, we take a deep breath and we're like, it's going to be all right. I don't know. I can't explain what it is, but why is not exaggerating how people love when you come on the Bleed Lows podcast. So thank you for joining us, especially because it is spooky season, October, Dodger playoffs every year. It's just a roller coaster. So what about today? Right now, Ned. How are you feeling about the Dodgers in October leading up, you know, what waiting for Saturday? Well, it, it, you'd always wish you had more of this or more of that. You wish that you had more starting pitching and healthier starting pitching. Um, but that's, there's a lot of different situations. Not no, hardly anybody feels good this time of year <laughs> on any team. Atlanta's had the greatest year of any team in the game, but look at their starting rotation right now. They've got questions and, and people may post up in their first round, but you know, they're not, they're not completely healthy and they've lost Charlie Morton. Max Fried is not a hundred percent right now. Uh, Strider has pitched a lot of innings. Great, great young arm, great pitcher, but an elder kind of came out, you know, this year as a rookie, you know, how's, how's October going to be for the, for that group? So I think the Dodgers have as good a chance as anybody. I also think the way it's, it's set up, 
I would rather play Arizona, Milwaukee than Philly or my, well, Miami, Miami, I would cluster with Arizona and, and uh, Milwaukee, but Philly's got a chance to beat anybody, especially because the home games in that ballpark, as I can well attest, it's <laughs> tough to win there. And so I think the Dodgers are in a great spot and I think they catch a break really with the, the being the second seed rather than the first seed. I think the first seed's actually got a tougher path to the World Series. Yeah. What is that? I, I, Juan mentioned talking about reseeding. Is this where you want to bring it up? Because they have a tougher path. But I, I we need to believe, right? Dodger fans need to believe that there is still some magic. There's that talk about this season, this year, the Dodgers, because the Dodgers aren't supposed to be where they're at. Are, are, are we going to get that confirmation from you that this is a special team or no? Well, I think it's going to be a special team. You know, I look, the, the month of October will determine how special. But do they have a chance? Yes, they've got as good a chance as anybody and a better chance than most. And, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. I I, I never get too far ahead of myself. I, I know what's what's come. I, I know what I know that I don't know what's coming, but I know whatever <laughs> it is, it's going to be a challenge to every organization. So we'll see how it goes. But I think they're sitting in a good spot, even though you wish that you had more more starting pitching and, and a bit healthier starting pitching. OK, Juan, I'm, I'm a little calmer now. What about you? <laughs> well, look. Like Ned, you're the only person that's been in, in in these situations, in the playoffs. Take us behind the curtain, Ned. I mean, they got a week. They're waiting to see who they're going to play. In this case, as a team, do you play to your strength or is this matchups? Like when they're making decisions about what the playoff roster is going to look like, who's going to make the cut? Do you sit there and go, look, these are the guys that got me here. I got to go with them. Are you looking at, well, we're getting the Diamondbacks or we're getting the Brewers? I think probably 80, 85% of your roster, you know, going in. I think the other 10 to 15% or 20%, I think you you do use some matchup. Uh, there's a team with great versatility. They've got a lot of players who've contributed to this situation. Um, so I think you think about who you're going to play. And you have two different two different sets of, of rosters that you're going you're going to activate for it, but I think most of your team you know who who it is you know who they're going to play you know how much they're going to play, barring injury, uh, what your starting lineup's going to be for the most part. Your pitching can be a little bit more matchup, and it depends on on where they're at. You know, this week is, is both a blessing and, and could be a curse too because teams can get flat during this week. But I don't see this team. I think the experience that they have is, is so broad as far as how many different things the organization's been through when it comes to the postseason. There's very few things that, that they haven't been through. You look at other teams, they haven't been there as often. Atlanta's been there a lot lately. Philly was there last year. But some of the teams, when was the last time Arizona was there? You know, mm -hmm. how far has Milwaukee got? They got to the LCS a few years ago against the Dodgers, lost in seven. But you know, lot, some of those guys aren't there anymore. The Dodgers have the continuation of 11 years of playoff baseball to fall back on. And I think that's got great value. They know how to prepare for a long layoff. Some players need it. Some players have been through a lot physically, probably all been through a lot physically, but some need the break. Others are fine and others know how to ramp up and how to compete against your teammates or what, whoever you're hitting BP off of or whoever you're you're working out against to get yourself ready for Saturday. Well, you know, Alicia is very worried because she wanted to make sure that she's going to the game on Saturday, but she wants to make sure because she wants to see Kershaw, right, Alicia? Absolutely. Don't want to miss any of Kershaw's starts. Uh, yeah. well, because I feel like, not that I think he's going to, I'm leaning towards Kershaw will come back, but, I have other people coming at me that he's going to leave Kershaw. He's going to go to Texas. He's going to retire. So I do get nervous. I feel like any chance we get to see Kershaw pitch, we've got we to gotta be there. And, and it's October, and it's game one, and it's Kershaw day. So I really wanted to be there. We had a friend of the Carne Asada manager, Dave Robertson. He confirmed on our show that Kershaw was going game one. So that just made my day, and that's why I decided – 
If I could only choose one game, it has to be that game. Did I make the right choice, Ned? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you're seeing greatness. Anytime you have a chance to see a Hall of Famer, especially somebody that pitches for the team that you root for and has never pitched anyplace else, uh, you know, that that's always a special time. And I, you know, I've been around Curse for a long time, probably half his life at this point in time, although I know, obviously right? the last couple of years we haven't spent that much time around each other. But, you know, he competes. Uh, this will be a big start for him. I think he takes every start um, as – it could be the end of, of his run. Who knows? He's He's got great perspective to life and great perspective to his career. And, you know, he may or may not know what he's doing next year. But I don't, as, as he would tell you, he's not really thinking about it. So uh, we can think about it and worry about it and, and guess what's going to happen. I think I'd rather just watch the playoffs play out and watch Saturday play off and whatever comes after that, we'll figure it out. I love it. So basically be present one. I need to just focus on enjoying the game and not worry about what is coming. So I will. I will yeah, appreciate about that. Tomorrow. All we got is today. That's it. I love it. Thank you. Go. See again. I'm calmer now. Right? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Easier, easier said than done. Uh, look, Ned, no uh, one had to get more creative as a general manager than you did. And now I hear Roberts telling us that they're going to get creative with their pitching staff. And you already said the first you want the starting rotation could be stronger, could be healthier. Ned, if you are the one in that room having that conversation, we're talking about starters maybe giving you four innings, piggyback. Like, is it possible, or am I just trapped in an era that no longer exists? Like can or is this where we're going to see a team literally win the World Series doing bullpen games for the majority of a series? Is that possible? Well, I, I think it's harder. Um, but there, there's an area of a team that gets overlooked many times in the month of October, and that's really who pitches the fourth, fifth, sixth innings. Because many times, especially before you had the DH, so it's a little bit less less valuable maybe today because you got the DH everywhere. But sometimes if you fell behind three to nothing and you needed to make a pitching change, who's ever pitching those middle innings can stop the game. It might be three to nothing. Look at, at yesterday with, uh, with Arizona. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they fell behind three to nothing, fell behind on the road and stopped the game. In essence, stopped, stopped Milwaukee and then cobbled their way back and, and took the lead and won the game. So, I think that role is very important. Um, I think if you can get, you, you try to get, you try to buy outs, especially in the postseason. However you get them, you get them. And after every series, you got a chance to to reset your pitching staff. If guys are starting to get tired or if you use somebody, maybe three or four games out of a five-game series uh, that, that you could put them on the side and bring somebody else in because you got the depth to do it. But I would never overlook the middle of those those uh, those staffs. Look back to the the staff that uh, Dontrell Willis was on that won the World Series in Florida. I think everybody but maybe one pitcher, one of their starting pitchers, pitched in relief in that series. So it's not that uncommon. Yeah. Uh, you go back to San Diego, way back in early in my career, uh, Cubs in San Diego. You look at how their middle relief, how they're starting pitching who had to come in and stop games out of a bullpen, how that helped them win the five-game LCS back in 1984. So I, th I think the Marlins with Dontrell, I think if you look back at that, you're going to find a lot of that starting pitching found ways to help and pitch in relief. You got to do it sometimes. So it's not that unusual. It's a little bit tougher depending on where guys are at in the wear and tear of a season that's already you know on uh, in, in their past there. But I think it's – if you can manage it well and your guys can compete and match up well, you can get it done. You know, Eric Carroll came on the show and was speaking a little bit about that because what he was saying in terms of one through 14, the, all the arms the Dodgers have in the bullpen, he has more faith in that of the teams in the playoffs. I hear you. That Phillies lineup, that, that scares me, right? Because those guys is, can get hot. Yep. The Dodgers have a lot of young arms. In your experience, Ned, is it better to just be ignorant? I don't know what I'm getting myself into, so I'm going to be able to perform? Or is are we going to see a moment where these rookies are going to get caught up and the big stage, the bright lights, it, it might hit them? 
Well, uh, you know, we don't know. We're gonna, we're about to find out. Um, you know, Clayton early in his career, when things would start to speed up a little bit, he threw harder, 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 and and the results weren't always what he was looking for. So we're going to learn a lot. I think in, in scouting, when you watch a playoff game, it's like watching seven or eight games in one as far as what you learn about the people who are playing for you or against you. It's it's not like Major League Baseball where it's one game is one game. You get to the playoffs, you can learn probably six or seven, take you six or seven games to learn what you can learn in one game. But the one thing that you're not going to know until you get there is how do people – how do they face pressure? How do they face the bright lights, the 50,000 people in whatever stadium you're playing in, I guess, except for maybe Tampa, the true 19,000. <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you do with that? And, and can you keep the game slow? And I think it's important that with the young pitching that Will Smith, you know, or Austin, who's ever catching that if they see somebody start to speed up, they go out, they stop the game for a minute. They get, they get somebody to take a breath and reset, you know, uh, Bobby Miller, I, I think is, is yearning for this opportunity. So he may be a little bit too quick early until he can get into a pace. But I think, you know, when you look at how he's pitched and his demeanor and his perspective on what he's trying to accomplish, he's somebody that I would have no hesitation. He reminds me a little bit of Walker Bueller, who I think is one of the great postseason pitchers of the last seven, eight, nine years. I know he's been hurt a couple times, but you look at how he goes about what he does. He's as good as anybody I've been around when it comes to competing in the biggest of games. He's fierce with it. It's like, let's go. Well, you know, this will, We'll see how this goes, but he's got great confidence. I think Bobby Miller has got some of that too. Hey, guys, see all this knowledge you're going to be able to drop when you're at Dodger Stadium, Alicia, uh, in game one. <laughs> and you could say, the padrino told me. Um, you know, my friend Ned told me. <laughs> um, well, hopefully I'll be right. You, know? I think, yeah. <laughs> you were talking about experience earlier, and, and my co-host brought up the young and the veterans. Ned Coletti, the author of, the creator of the Roy Campanella Award. This year, the guys, the Dodgers, they voted in Jason Hayward. How big, how huge is that acquisition for the Dodgers to get Jay Hay, who, from all reports, that other team didn't want him anymore. And he's just worked out so well here. Did you know that when they acquired the Dodgers got Jay Hay, that this would work out? Well, I, you, you sense that it will. A, a, a couple things. First of all, that, that award, thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, as I... You know, I've been a student of baseball my whole, basically my whole life, and a, and a great respect with the Dodgers organization and the players who came before. And I had a chance many years ago to meet Mr. Campanella, and that there was not an award honoring him and a, and a player who performed to the to the skills and to the the situations that that Mr. Campanella was tremendous at, three time MVP. When, when catchers rarely won MVPs, when, when black catchers and his half black, half Italian would win an MVP. And what he did was remarkable. And then, of course, how his career ended with the tragedy of the, the car accident and uh, his, his disablement. But uh, that, to me, is one of the best honors in the organization because the players vote on it. It's your peers yeah. that end up selecting the winner of the Campanella Award. So that, I think, would probably mean a lot to, to Jason Hayward. And just to, to comment to, to finish up your, your thought on Jason, you know, I think, and I, I think you can look around baseball or any sport, really, you can look around the NBA, NHL, NFL, a lot of different sports. When somebody signs a really big contract, and that's what he signed in Chicago, the type of contract that kind of caught the industry by surprise. People were kind of surprised. Thought, wow, this, this might be an overpay, you know, um, no disrespect, but people, people thought that. And I think the when when you're a player, you know what people think, and you know what what is expected of you. And sometimes, and I don't I don't know Jason well enough to to speculate on his thoughts to it. So I'm just going to speak in real, real general terms. But many times, a player that signs a big contract has a tough time living up to their contract. And as it as it starts to snowball, it starts to get worse and worse and worse. And I think the second place they go 
They don't think about that. He's on the same contract. Dodgers are paying a very small percentage of it. They're paying the, the major league minimum of that contract, and the Cubs are paying the rest. So the Cubs paid, you know, they paid a lot of money to watch Jason Hayward have a great year in Los Angeles. But I think, <laughs> I think there's less pressure. There's, uh, I think players can play freer when they don't have that type of contract that they're trying to live up to. Because no matter who you are, you know, athletes that I've been around, a bunch of them that have that have had great careers and other ones that have had careers that needed a reset for whatever reason. And I think the reset for Jason Hayward has been terrific. I think his leadership, I think how he um, how he plays has been great, certainly. He's been a very, very productive player. I think he's also been one of the most productive people when it comes to the clubhouse and when it comes to leadership. This team doesn't lack leadership, but you'll never have more leadership than you need. So adding him to that, that circle of leaders and experienced veterans and people who have been through a lot, uh, I think was really, really a, a bright move and, and something that's that's rejuvenated his career along the way. Awesome, just awesome. And again, I'm a big fan of that award. And I do also have to thank you for providing a definition of what is the Roy Campanella Award, because it seems like MLB's MVP award does not have a definite definition. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you make it easier yeah. for the guys to vote for their, you know, who they believe in that clubhouse should win the Roy Campanella Award. So I don't know if we have time to get into the MVP. I got, I got steered in the direction of Acuna Jr. does deserve it. But I was pro Freddie Freeman, even Mookie, at least to be at the same level of conversation. But Eric Carroll's kind of schooled me recently that Acuna Jr. does deserve it. So I'm going to just shut up about it. But again, thank you for the Roy Campanella Award. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting debate. You know, I, I think that, you know, Acuna will win it. Um, you know, Mookie and, and Freddie have been terrific. I think, um, you know, and, and again, it, it goes a little bit to your your conversation about, so what is the MVP? You know, exactly. is it the player of the year or is it the most valuable player? Because as good as Acuna has been, he has been probably the best player in the game this year. No, no, Shohei as well. So either or. But when I think of a, a player that leads off and does what Mookie does offensively, and then you think of defense and the value of having somebody who plays gold glove defense at three positions, including two in the middle of the diamond at second and short, that is unique. And as, as I think about value to a team, I don't know that anybody provides more value than Mookie when you have the defensive versatility that he brings. He just doesn't stand there. Some guys can stand right. in a position for a day or two. He plays it. He plays it as well as anybody plays it, whether it's shortstop, second base, or right field. So, you know, that to me is perhaps the most valuable player. Player of the year, the best player in the game, best player in the league, sure. Ronald Acuna Jr. But it has a tremendous year, deserves that, that title and that honor. But most valuable? I don't know. I think somebody that can play three spots in a gold glove and lead off and do what he's done. I don't know how many guys are that valuable. <laughs> hey, Ned. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Ned. Uh, Ned, before we let you go, I, a couple of things I want to run by you. Uh, first of all, uh, it seems overall that the rule changes were a success this year. And I I know where the, the rules, the majority of them are going to be in place for the playoffs. Um, what were you, your thoughts on these rule changes? And do you see any of them impacting the playoffs? I mean, they played a whole season by it. It, it shouldn't be a hiccup, right, in, in the playoffs. Well, I, I hope it has no bearing on the playoffs. You know, like somebody you know, gets a ball called because they've taken too much time. Um, but, you know, they've already been through it. So, as you say, you know, the experience is already there. I think the rule changes have, in some ways, saved the game. I think it's it's uh, invigorated uh, the game. I think you you just saw the story probably in the last few days. The attendance is the greatest attendance they've had in a long time. 
the time of games has been shortened back, you know, 20, 30 years. I think it was necessary. I think it was imperative to do that. I think we probably lost some of the younger generation because of the duration of the sport. You know, I teach at Pepperdine and I, I teach very, very bright students. You're talking about people who have, were tops in their high school class. So people who have a great passion for sport and a great understanding of it and respect for them. And they'll talk NBA way before they'll talk Major League Baseball. They'll talk uh, English Premier League way before they talk Major League Baseball. And I think that baseball probably took a step back with the people that are 20 years of age and younger because of duration and because, you know, you don't have the marketing that you sometimes have had in, in other sports. So I think that this is the first step to really – a, a brilliant move by Rob Manford and, and Major League Baseball to tighten up the time of game, to get rid of the shift, okay? People have been shifting forever. I know the guy that did the first shift, Lou Boudreau with Ted Williams, back, you know, many years ago. I got a little visitor here walking through the Hi. <laughs> but, uh, Hello, uh, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I just think that they've been great to, to have and, and to really change, uh, change the sport. I think it's been a tremendous moves. So since yeah. we've been, there was a success of a rule change. Could we see another possible rule change in the future in terms of reseeding the playoffs? Because right now, unless the Rays make a comeback, we're going to see a 99 win team go down. And you, you, I mean, is it just one of those things that look, it just, it doesn't happen all the time. It's once a year. Should Major League Baseball reseed these teams after rounds of the playoffs? Um, good question. I, I think it, you know, I would need to take a, another look at it and, and study it a little bit deeper. You know, uh, it's what they wanted to do is they wanted to have more teams have a chance. They've done that. They wanted teams to um, they wanted to have value to winning your division. Tampa didn't win its division, so. You know, they, they face the consequences of that. You know, you can go back to 1993, the San Francisco Giants won 103 games and didn't play one playoff game. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, they were not even in it. There was no, you know, no opportunity, no wild card. So that can happen. And it, and it shows you that when you get to this month, your, your, your area of, of uh, your degree of failure is – is very tight. You, you don't have a lot of margin for error. And I think that that's been, you know, that's shown and you know, we'll see what they, what they can do today, but that's kind of the way the game goes and you can't play, you can't play a, a five game series to open up the playoffs and then play, you know, more series after that. And so you're playing into the middle of November. And I think it's too tough to shorten the season because of the revenue involved and, Everybody you know, wanting to get paid, whether it's the owner or whether it's the player. So I think it is what it is. I think it's been great. I think it's cool seeing Arizona in the postseason, uh, seeing Miami in the postseason. You know, typically they'd be home, but their fan base starts to get rejuvenated and you, you start to create more interest. Time of game creates more interest, more activity, more stolen bases, more interest. No shift, more offense, more interest. The whole thing is about keeping people entertained and keeping people keeping people interested. And I think they've done a great job of that. And if you you win 92, 99 games, you end up losing the first two and you're done. You haven't won your division. I guess the way out of that is next time you win 99 games, win your division. Win your division. <laughs> <laughs> Ned, last one. Uh I, I, if you can share with us, uh, you mentioned the, the tough times you had in Philadelphia. This time of year, is it even harder for you as a GM, you in the front office? You've done all the work to try to get this team into this position. And now it's up to the players in a certain sense, right? It's like it's out of your hands. Did you ever address a team going in, you know, to a playoff? Do, do, the, do the players hear from the front office? Like, do you get in there and, and pull a Lasorda and, you know, rip them a new one and say, you guys better win or you're all out on your asses next year? Well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. You know, I mean, there was only one Tommy. Um, and I would address the team 
on schedule twice, three times really, uh, twice when the season was still on. One is the eve of the day that everybody shows up in spring training. Pitchers and catchers have been there for a few, for a few days. Now your position players. You look at the room, everybody that's on your roster, every non-roster invite, all your coaching staff, including some of your minor league staff, is on one, all in one place. Three or four minutes, my address. Kind of recap the year before, maybe in 30 seconds, and then talk about what we're trying to accomplish this year and, and my impression of where we're at. And then, unless something happened, when Manny got suspended, I had to address the team. When the team was sold in 2012, I addressed the team. I think I addressed the hitters maybe once or twice when they were going through a, like a 10, 12 game stretch where the offense disappeared. Um, always briefly. You know, I've, I've talked far longer in this podcast than I would talk to a team. You know, the, the, the <laughs> man is, is, you know, three or four minutes, they've heard enough, you know. Um, but I will also address them in the postseason as we as we embarked upon the postseason. We have an advance report that people, a lot of people have put a lot of time in. I would send, uh, if, it's, if it's Milwaukee and Arizona, I'd have four scouts there. I'd have one watching Milwaukee pitching, one walking, watching Milwaukee offense, and somebody who was good with strategy watching the manager. Two, uh, both of them, two people, one team. Same thing with Arizona. And then they would come in, if, if whoever they're playing, whoever we're playing, they would come in and, and really address the manager, the coaching staff, and the players. And at that point in time, I would also address the team. And the only other time I did it was at the end of a season where I would not really address the team as a, as a collective group, but just thank everybody one-on-one. -on -one. We won a lot of games, and we won a lot of games through a lot of different adversity and a lot of different things that we had no control over, and we had to fight through and, and do the best we could. And I always appreciated our, our players doing it. I think, I think I did the job nine years. We, we went to the playoffs in five, got eliminated, I think, the day before on a sixth. Obviously, you know some of the history of the, the different things the organization went through at that period of time. So uh, proud of the players and know what they they extended to it. And uh, when I would go around the room, you know, I would at the end and when it was all over and players had, had crushed it since the first of February and had given their all, um, I would see some of the toughest players I knew, people who would fight through everything and grind through everything. And it had the kind of life before baseball where they also had to do the same thing. And I won't mention the name, but there was this one player early in my run here and had in the locker, wouldn't turn around, I tapped him on the shoulder, said, hey. And he finally turned around, tears streaming down his face. It meant that much to him. So, uh, you know, you see the reactions of people. But, you know, to answer your question, yeah, I would, I would do it a, just a couple times a year. I didn't live in the clubhouse. The clubhouse wasn't mine. It was the players. But I would be around three or four days a week walking through. If I needed to see somebody, you know, they knew I was coming to see them. If they needed to see me, they knew I wasn't going to disappear, or, uh, that I would be around enough that if they had a question, uh, they knew where to find me. Manager, coaching staff, almost daily, just to check in, see how they're doing. Rarely after a game, because you never want a motion to enter into any of your decision making. Uh, and so I would, if we had a tough day or some, some things I needed some clarification on, I would wait till the next day, sleep on it, let, uh, let whatever frustration or emotion I had kind of seep out and then start the day fresh and just ask questions. These are all tough jobs. The manager's job, very tough job. Coaching, tough. Playing at the big league level, very, very difficult. Only so many can do it. Being successful in the month of October, you have even a smaller list. So much respect for those that compete and compete to the utmost lead and manage and coach at this time of year, any time of year, but especially this time of year. I, I just want to follow up because it seems that the scouts now are, you know, poor, they're getting diminished. Are they still doing like what you would do? Sending scouts? Is that still something prevalent in I, today's I game? They do. I believe they do. To what extent? I, I don't have any idea to what extent, but I, I think it's important. Um, you know, you can learn a lot from analytics. There's no doubt. You can learn a lot from video. Uh, I'll tell you one one quick story as the value of having a scout at the ballpark. 
uh, it was the August trade deadline with a waiver, the waiver you know, when there used to be a waiver deadline. And it was uh, July 31st. And I was looking for a player who could play infield, especially in the middle of the, the diamond, uh, who was primarily a shortstop. And I had a scout in the ballpark the last day watching two teams play out of the race. They were just playing the game to get it off the schedule and to get ready to go home. And in the in the ninth inning of the game, there was a ball hit to this player who was playing shortstop. And it took a little bit of a tricky hop. And his hand, his right hand, went in the glove right before the ball. And so he ends up with a finger injury. Okay. But he throws the runner out. The throw didn't look normal. Throw the runner, threw the runner out. He doesn't hit in the bottom of the ninth inning. If I don't have a scout there, I may make that deal. Because if I'm just looking, if I'm just, you know, player didn't come out of the game, player made the last play defensively for his team, you think nothing of it. The scout calls me and he says, I check on his right hand because the right hand went in the glove a split second before the ball. And I think he, he may have injured his hand. And sure enough, he broke a finger. And without somebody in the ballpark, you may or may not know that. So stop me from making a mistake. You know, you learn a lot when you watch people right. perform. I love that you share those stories, by the way. You know, and I and I, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on. Yeah. I, I think you have soothed some nerves, uh, you know, and we're we're getting ready for this weekend. But we can't thank you enough for taking the time and and giving us your insight. It is it is sorely missed, and we 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 love it when you when you come on to share it. Yes, Thank you absolutely. very much. Thanks for having me. I'll say one more thing for the those who are a little nervous. I would rather, as I look at the playoff teams, I would rather be the Dodgers right now than any other team. Does that mean they're going to win anything? Doesn't mean that. But I would rather be the Dodgers where they're at with their experience. And what lies ahead for the other team that is a super team in the league, Atlanta. I would much rather be the Dodgers, and we'll see how it goes. Control what you can and pray for the rest. <laughs> there you go. There, it's, there, beautifully yeah. said there. You know, right. let's hope for the best and expect the worst, everybody. Let's well, go. I, would, I didn't say that. <laughs> expect the worst, you know, but, you know, just – See how my it goes. We learn a lot. I appreciate you having pass. me on. Let's do it again this winter sometime if you like to. Absolutely, Ned. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This episode of the Bleed Lows podcast has been brought to you by betonline.ag, where the game starts. Thank you.